Hello and welcome to Blackhawks Insider, the official podcast of the Chicago Blackhawks, presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com. Drive what Kane and Taves drive. It's the Patrick Sharp episode of the Blackhawks Insider podcast as we check in with one of the members of our broadcast team. Of course, Patrick Sharp had an amazing career in a Blackhawks sweater, and we talk about the transition from going from player to broadcaster and lots of other fun things with Sharpie as well. Stick around. You won't want to miss it. It's an all-star break week episode of the Blackhawks Insider Podcast, and it starts now. All right, everybody, welcome in. Alongside Kaylee Chelios, Colby Cohen, Chris Foster is with you. Hey, we made it to all-star break. Everybody, uh, how are we feeling? I, I, I can't believe that we're already at this point in the season. I feel good. I think that stretch getting to the holiday break is a big one, and you start to you know, pick your places on the calendar of where you can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel because it's a lot of hockey, and I'm sure for the players, it's been a very long season already, and they're still just barely over halfway through. So I, I think the, the wins have been huge for the energy around the building, the practice, our broadcast. There's a lot of positives to talk about. So I'm feeling pretty good going into All-Star break. What about you, Colby? Forget the players, Kaylee. I, I'm worried about us. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about all of, of us broadcasters. So, you know, I, I think that the All-Star break and the whole bye week, uh, I love how they've put that into the schedule. I think it just provides, you know, a great recharge for, for not only the players, but for everybody involved. And, and I think it, it gives us all an opportunity to take a deep breath, appreciate hockey because I think when you get into the throes of every other day and it all starts blending together, you don't know what city you're in, you know, you don't know, you know, what, you know, time zone you're in. So I, I just think that it, it provides this great sort of recharge reset, um, get a little sun, a little vitamin D always makes everybody's body feel a little bit better. So hopefully everybody's got plans to be somewhere sunny. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I love it. I, I think it's a good thing for the, for the stretch run here. Uh, look, January was, uh, I mean, for broadcasters or players, it was, it was a pretty fun month. Uh, Blackhawks racked up more points in a single month in January than they did, uh, in any other month. And I, I know one thing that we talked a lot about uh, on the broadcast, and I heard you guys breaking this down from the studio side as well during intermissions, but the, the balanced scoring, everyone was getting involved and, there were some uh, there were some really individual bright moments as well. I mean, we got the tease from Lucas Reichel when he came up and had a three point game in, in in the first win over Calgary in January, and and Jackson Stauber. I mean, called up from Rockford, kind of in in an emergency pinch hit situation, and and stands on his head in two games on the road in St. Louis and then on the road in Calgary. I mean, there were, there were lots of of moments to to talk about both individually and team-wise, that that I think we'll um, continue to look back on once the season's over also. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I'm with you on that, Chris. I think out of the whole season, this last stretch was probably the most exciting to watch the group come together, and that's a big credit to Luke Richardson and his coaching staff at this point in the season to be playing a more – disciplined brand of hockey and staying to their structure and they've over doubled I think the amount of goals that they had from the month of December they had 21 goals in 13 games and they've just been shipping away and putting a lot of goals in the net so I think the scoring has been exciting and the Hawks speed and that's kind of part of this identity that they've seemed to found has been a big part of their success and some of their key players so you mentioned it, injection of youth with Stauber and Reichel. There's just a lot of uh, key players up and down the lineup that have stepped up in the absence of some of their big players, like Kane and Taze, who weren't able to be uh, in every single game during this win streak. So a lot of good things to like about the balance scoring. And if you take the X's and O's and, and all that out of it, it it's just an, been a lot more fun to watch this group smile and win hockey games. I mean, at the end of the day... Um, yes, we are wearing headsets or microphones while we're watching these hockey games, you know, in our everyday roles, but we're also watching hockey games, right? Like we all want to sit there and enjoy what we're watching um, and see the team have success and see people smile. And, and it, it, it was a, 
it was just an enjoyable batch. And, um, you know, you, you have all the people that are whining now about, uh, oh, well, we're not going to get Bedard, this and that. And, you know, my answer is at the end of the day, like it's, it's more fun to see a team win. You know, how this is going to shake out at the end of the year, it, it's out of everybody's control. It, it really is. I mean, um, you know, but ultimately if you're – sitting at a bar and you're having a beer or a drink or whatever and like you're watching this team play right now i mean they're 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 fun to watch i mean this game in calgary most recent was i mean that was a good hockey game i mean it's it's not an easy team to beat it's not an easy place to play you know all these guys are scoring goals they're not household names by any means and and you've got goaltenders who are probably slotted fourth or fifth on your depth chart coming up to the nhl you know, free agent signing undraft. I mean, they're just like feel good stories. And, you know, I, I just think, especially for us, it's easy to rally around those types of moments. And I think for the fan base, it's easy to rally around types of moments. So, you know, kudos to the guys for finishing strong going into all-star break. That's not always the case. Uh, a lot of times you're, you've got one foot into the Bahamas already, if that's where you're headed. Um, but, you know, it, it's been, it's definitely been a, a nice little run here in January. Well, without further ado, let's bring Patrick Sharp onto this episode now. Uh, and actually, before we do that, a, a quick reminder to our wonderful audience that we'd love to hear from you throughout the course of, of this season on the Blackhawks Insider Podcast. And so if you have comments that you'd like to share, maybe or questions for that matter, uh, just go to our YouTube page, leave us a comment there, or use the hashtag Blackhawks Mailbag on your social media posts to let us know questions that you have, questions you want us to ask in the future for our, ourselves or for guests or just general feedback. We, we'd love to hear from you as we continue to roll on on the Blackhawks Insider Podcast. So now, without further ado, let's welcome in our friend Patrick Sharp. Patrick Sharp makes his Blackhawks Insider Podcast debut and as we tape this, we're in Patrick Sharp's home province of Alberta. So, Sharpie, we had to get you on as the Blackhawks take their final road trip before the All-Star break, a Western Canada swing. You know, big picture, uh, how's this season been for you? You're first in the booth. I know it's not your first foray post-playing into the media world. You had a stint on the desk at NBC when they had the NHL rights. But, you know, coming into the the game commentating role and working with the, the team that you spent the majority of your career with. What's your rookie season been like in the booth? Yeah, it's been fun. You know, it's uh, it's a new challenge, that's for sure. I, I enjoy doing the studio stuff and still do, but um, enjoy a new challenge of jumping on the broadcast with yourself and, and Colby's on there for some of the home games as well. And, um, you know, it's fun learning on the fly, but more than anything, it's just fun to be around the team again and go on some road trips and remember what it was like to travel with uh, such a huge travel party. And uh, so far, so good, having fun. Um, season's given us some good moments and a little bit of excitement, um, but more than anything, just happy to be around. I should correct you, my home province, I don't, I'm not going to claim it as Alberta. Okay. I mean, okay. I lived here for a while when I was a kid, but I like to say that I was uh, raised in Thunder Bay, Ontario. So that's my hometown, Thunder Bay. Fair so enough. Get it well, right, Fosters. We'll, get we'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll <laughs> be in Ontario later this season. I think that just means we'll have to get you on the podcast yeah. again. So. Yeah, <laughs> you think, we'll you see think, if my internet connection works when we get there. You'd think your partner in the broadcast booth would be able to nail down your hometown. I mean, we've talked about it more than one time on the air. So, I mean, strike one, Chris. That's a, he's a rookie also. He's learning. Still, yeah, still lots to learn. Sharpie, do you know what Chris's hometown is? What do you think about Milwaukee and, and uh, the people from oh, good old Wisconsin? You you totally just helped him out there because uh, I mean oh. he was gonna be he's gonna be drawing a blank on Chris's hometown. Come on. Yeah, I don't have much on Milwaukee. Um, we had the, the preseason game there. Yeah, I mean year, we only was like I mean Foster's was the mayor of the city, walking around, <laughs> shaking hands, taking pictures. It was we could barely do the broadcast. He was Foster's Va uh, took a lot of heat after the Dahmer documentary came out, and uh, we had uh, some conversations about <laughs> Milwaukee and some of the bad eggs, as he called it, that 
emerged from that city. <laughs> we got a tough balance Terrible. on that one, but uh, <laughs> you, you've overcome that. I'm a, I like the Brewers, I suppose. I know you're probably not supposed to say that. Uh, living in Chicago with the, with the Cubs, but the Brewers, they put on a good product, nice ballpark, and uh, always have a competitive team. So I, I hear Chris talking about the Brew Crew every once in a while on the, on the air. Sharpie's a, a big baseball fan and uh, yeah. had, a, had a good baseball career in Thunder Bay, right? That was your off-season sport? I mean, if we're going <laughs> to call it a career, coming out of Thunder Bay for baseball, uh, our season was like, I don't know, six weeks long. We played in gravel pits. I like to pitch. I like to play center field. I was a pretty good uh, shortstop, but our fields were were um, unpredictable on the ground balls, and I didn't want to get hit in the face with any, so I went out in the outfield and, and caught fly balls instead. But uh, I love baseball. The, the Blue Jays won the, the World Series in 91 and 92 when I was like 10 years old. So that was right in my wheelhouse, and it kind of got me hooked on the game. Interesting that you played center field. That's that's a defensive position, and you know, I mean, it, you know, you were you were known as a shooter in in the in the NHL. Ah, it's about those ground balls, man. I would like turn my head and <laughs> make errors. You can't be playing shortstop in little league when you make errors every time the balls hit to you. <laughs> well, Chris, as as much as we yeah, sorry, Kelly, as much as we want to give him a hard time about you know his his lack of defensive awareness yeah. you you look at sharpie's numbers like he didn't really the meat of his career he was always a plus player so he he must have been doing something right you know you're not getting pluses on the power play which means that he must have been out there for some some <laughs> even some even strength goals so you know i think sharpie was a better defensive player than than he than he likes to let on you know that's Thank like the you, meat. Colby. that Thank might you. be the well i'm surprised you're happy to hear me say that you know saying to an offensive player <laughs> that they're good defensive is is like it's sometimes insulting to players you know they, they don't like hearing it no i like it and um i don't even really think of myself as an offensive player um to be honest with you my career took a lot of different twists and turns and when i went to uh, philadelphia to start my pro career i was kind of labeled as a third or fourth line centerman i played center for the first half of my career and um, learned from john stevens and ken hitchcock in philly and and they basically you know, beat the offensive side of the game out of me and, and taught me how to compete and be good on, on the D side. And then as, as my career evolved, I got moved to the wing in Chicago at some point and, and realized, hey, I don't have to, to worry too much about what's going on in the D zone. I got Jonathan, I got Hosa, and <laughs> some other good defensemen out there. I can maybe take a few more chances and score goals. And Plus, you got more attention whenever you scored goals, so I kind of switched to that side of it. Well, well Kelly, I don't, I don't mean to keep jumping in on you, Kelly, but Sharpie, you're kind of opening up a, a can of worms of, of some stuff that <laughs> you know I, I, w I wanted to talk about with you on the podcast today because you know I think it's good for the Blackhawk fan base to sort of hear and see a player that look, it, it's no secret the fans here. You you had a great run, part of the three cups. You know they they feel like you're a native son, but. You know, you had to take your time getting to the NHL, right? I mean, it was a couple of years in the American League. It was, you know, getting some games that second year. And then it seems like, you know, maybe your third year, you went back and played even more in the American League than, than the year before. So you had to be patient. And, and we had a guy make his NHL debut against um, Vancouver the other night who was 27 years old. And, and every path is so different. So... Were there times in those those early days for you where you were feeling like, when is this going to happen for me? Is this going to happen for me? I, I got to continue to trust the process, listen to the organizations, be patient, you know, all that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I look back at my time in the American League and think that it was uh, extremely valuable for me and, and the projection trajectory of my career, actually. And, you know, when I went to Philly, I didn't know if I was going to be in the East Coast League, the American League or the NHL. I just left Vermont with... Uh, with dreams of being a pro. And I think I played three games, three call-ups for single games my first year just to fill in. Uh, second year, I started to get a little bit better in the minors, a little more confident. And I think I split the season half and half, finished up with the NHL. Then the following season, Colby, was the, uh, the lockout. So I was really, it was like perfect timing. I look back on my career and I had really great timing at every, every turn of it. Because there was no NHL, I was on an entry-level deal. I was able to continue to play and, and go back down 
to the Phantoms, and we ended up winning a championship there. I was an all-star, and it's kind of a great way to graduate from the league and, and sign a one-way contract and never look back. But just because I meant to the NHL after that, it wasn't exactly an easy ride. It takes a long time for me anyway to adjust to ice time opportunity, different positions, and I had to change organizations. Uh, playing for Philadelphia, which was, uh, I think if you go back then, we had a lot of veteran players up front, Keith Primo and Ronick and Recky and all those guys, John LeClaire. I mean, we can, we can <laughs> go back and look good. at some of the all-stars <laughs> that were ahead of me, right? And um, I, I kind of knew that my opportunity was limited. We added a couple good young players who were younger than me in Jeff Carter and Mike Richards, who were great flyers as well. So the writing was kind of on the wall, and uh, I knew I had to – to get an opportunity somewhere else. So uh, Chicago was uh, happened to be there available to make a trade. And uh, I came over to the Hawks, but, but once again, like to relate to some of the young players on our team, when I asked to, to go to Chicago for more opportunity, I got that opportunity. And my first 25 games as a Hawk, I had zero goals. So our team was in last place and, and it was uh, it was a rough ride. So, it's not always a, a perfect beginning to your career, like like we saw with Kane and Taves. They're great all stars right out of the jump. It took me a long time to develop, and I think I didn't really turn into a player until I was 24, 25, 26 years old. So, different paths for every player, and uh, I'm certainly proud of the one that I went on. Well, it certainly makes me realize how old you are when you remind us of the Calder Cup championship because I was physically at that game, but I was still in middle school. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can know why the hairs are a little gray on the side there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, don't mention that. Come on. I'm trying to hide. <laughs> don't worry, Sharpie. I, I won't give you any more gray hairs, I promise. <laughs> uh, you, you know, look, you, you want to stay around the game. That's clear. There's lots of different ways that you can do that. Uh, Looking at broadcasting specifically, though, I mean, what's different about covering the game as a broadcaster versus versus being a player? You know, what's what's different about your daily routine? Um, you know, how you prepare for games, how you feel uh, about games, and and maybe there are some similarities too. Yeah, it's very similar, I would say. I mean, the physical side's a little bit different, um, but game day feels the same to me. I want to get some information on the team that we're playing and get myself ready to go for, for being ready for game time. And I think that's just the, the biggest plus in, in doing the job for me on a personal reason is that I get to come back and be a part of the team in some way. Uh, the Hawks were, were so meaningful to me in my career. And, and when you stop playing, it's, it's over, it's over quick. And um, a lot of players are left searching what to do and what's next. I was up given a pretty good opportunity to do some NBC studio work with the Hawks and uh, with the national scene. And that was a great experience, but I'm really enjoying being back with the, with the Hawks on a, a more frequent level and uh, being on the road, Chris, it's fun to, to be around the guys again and some familiar faces feels like we're uh, we're a team again. Other than blasting Pearl jam, what was uh, your pregame routine when you were playing? Yeah, it varied. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't one of those players like Seabrook that, had a million superstitions and, and had to do it on the, the every minute on the minute. I was uh, very loose before a game. I had a tennis ball a lot of the time. Um, I would like throw that off a wall and, and play catch with myself, maybe smoke a guy in the back when he wasn't looking and <laughs> run away, just kind of goof around, get jumping, get the body moving. But there was other times where I didn't, didn't leave my stall and just sat there and, and waited for warmups to come. So that's one thing I noticed as I was leaving the game as a player was like all these guys coming in are in great physical shape. They, they have these incredible warm ups and cool downs. And it's, it's really like, it's not just a plus to be fit. It's mandatory now and it's a part of the game. So, you know, the game has changed quite a bit, but I'm fortunate when I look back, I got a little bit of the old school as Colby mentioned with the old timers. And then I got to see some of these new age kids wind it up as well. Sharpie, do you remember when I ran into you back in the day, 2013 Pearl Jam I was, concert? I was wondering if that was going to come up. That's I, I just we, thought about it again, yes. I, that, that was an awesome show. That was like, <laughs> we just won the Stanley Cup because the season was pushed back that year, I think because of the, the first half lockout. And um, they were playing mid-July and we had maybe won the Cup two weeks prior. And 
it was an awesome show, sunny day, everybody was having fun, and uh, where we were kind of sitting was like a who's who of, of people, <laughs> like a, a pretty cool section, and I saw your dad first, and he introduced me to his whole crew, and I think that's where we met for the first time. Not bad seats to watch a show, eh? No, it was pretty good. Yeah, I remember bumping into you. I think I still have selfies on my old computer of like selfies <laughs> we took from the concert. I got to bring them back and see if we remember them. I tried to get the cup for that game and we mm -hmm. had this whole thing where like, you know how Eddie sometimes brings people out on stage? Yes, I Your remember when you were like going to go. A <laughs> hundred times and the show was on Saturday and Taves had the cup up in Winnipeg for the weekend. So we weren't able to get it. I tried to call the league and get the, uh, like the backup Stanley cup, you know, the replica <laughs> one that stays at the hall of fame when the real <laughs> cup is out on tour. I was like, I gotta bring the cup out on stage, but it never happened, but it was, it was a great day and a great show. Nonetheless, it was a lot of fun. I'll go back to hockey, but, um, I wanted, I wanted to ask you, so broadcasting, Chris asked you about some of the similarities and differences. And I wondered, I found it so funny that former players, seem so uncomfortable when they first start in the interview segments oh where God. you have to interview a player but you've done so many as a player yourself I would have thought it's like bread and butter for you guys like I know exactly what to ask who to ask and what I want what why do you guys not like interviewing players <laughs> I don't know but that is the, that's the best question I've been asked and I'd love an answer for it it's so uncomfortable <laughs> Colby you do a good job um, down at ice level in the heat of the moment. <laughs> so bad. And Chris and I always love the uh, the crowd pump up <laughs> at the end of a big win. That's that's a I skill can. that that very few have. But every game, I, I think about that question or two that I have to ask a player at some point, and uh, I don't know why it's so hard. It's like uh, Chris is good at it. He always makes fun of me, and he's elbowing me when we're off camera and making fun of my questions. Um, a couple of times I've asked questions and the players like have just disagreed with me point blank right to my I, face. I can and that's think always... of a couple actually offhand, and I wondered how you <laughs> felt about that. I know, great, oh great God, for I the confidence, so... right? Yeah, so whatever. I mean, it's something new. Uh, I did have a good one yesterday, right, Chris, uh, in Vancouver. I thought that was my best one of the year. So definitely, maybe we're on the upward upward trail here. Next, next step, next, and this will be a big step. But we're going to try and get Sharpie to ask two questions. <laughs> do you have That's a soft? Do you have a soft spot for the media side a little bit in terms of like having to ask sometimes obvious questions or questions that you're like you you remember as a player being like, why'd you ask that? Do you do you see our side? Yeah, and now your yeah, side. For sure. I, I'm definitely seeing both sides. And, you know, as a player, I'm trying to think of, of how I felt. I, I kind of just clumped the whole media in one big group. So if if somebody was giving me a hard time, I would just assume that that was everybody in the media and then maybe put my guard up a little bit. Sometimes I think players feel that way. Um, Chris and I were on the bus yesterday in Vancouver and, and Taves comes on the bus and uh, we're just laughing and joking, having a good time. And I asked him about coming back to Vancouver. Like, oh, it's pretty cool to be back in the building. A lot of good memories here. And he just looks at me. He's like, is this an interview? <laughs> you know, like so much for being buddies for the last 20 years. It's like a media thing now. But, you know, it's a little bit different being on the other side. But I'm not trying to, to bury any players or really dive too deep into what's going on. I just want to tell the story of the game and, and make it as fun as possible, I suppose. Well, Chris is certainly going to force you to have fun one way or the other when you're in the booth. <laughs> I know there's always those moments in the broadcast where I would love it if we had footage of the Snoop cam so we could see your face, Sharpie, while Chris is, you know, on one of his, his <laughs> tangents. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to warm up to Chris uh, more and more. And uh, these road trips help, you know, spend a lot of time with each other on the plane and watching a lot of hockey. So, um, you know, I'm starting to figure him out a little bit. Every time we, we go into a, an on-camera spot in the game, he's got this little smirk in the corner of his mouth. And I know he's thinking about something. He's going to make fun of me for, for something I said or did. But, um, you know, we're having a good time, and hopefully it sounds okay. It certainly does sound like you guys are having a good time. I'm, I'm just kind of assuming at this point you're kind of coming into the broadcast just ready for one of his goofy one-liners and – you know, maybe it's an awkward silence or maybe you'll you'll start firing back at him one, one of these days. He certainly yeah, deserves I like, it. I like the, uh, the 
the boy band reference a couple of games ago. You said <laughs> the team looks like they're really in sync or something yeah, like that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you, you good line. Well, you called them right away on it. You were like, Chris, have you been sitting on that the entire – I mean, I, I think Chris sees theme nights in the atrium, and he literally gets his journal out and starts – writing down ideas for ways to try to torture you a little bit, Sharpie. So uh, it's great. But Keep I get coming. I think the next step, Sharpie, from Chris coming towards you, it's, it's going to have to be social media. I mean, you you used to be a little <laughs> more active on social media and, and you, you know, you used to post some some good stuff. And then all of a sudden it was, you know, a little bit of cold turkey. Now, now that you have joined the dark side, like winter. Give the fans what they want. I mean, we got the beautiful golden retriever at home. You got your beautiful family at home. I mean, when are when are we going to get a little be behind the scenes Patrick Sharp content? That's a good question. That did kind of just stop um, at some point. I don't know. It's uh, I feel like I have expectation to once you start posting and, and getting involved on that stuff, you got to maintain it daily or weekly or whatever. But I don't know. I try to stay off it as much as possible and. Um, try to be outside as much as possible. There's been t- days that I'm sure we were all guilty of where I stared at my phone for like 10 hours and didn't get much done. So I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the, the social media stuff. I'm more of a, more of a creeper, I guess. I have an account and I look at what's going on and I, I like photos and videos and stuff, but I don't post a whole lot. So I don't know, baby steps. You got me on the podcast. Right. Maybe uh, give me a couple more weeks right. and I'll start throwing well, some I, stuff out. I can always count on a like from you, Sharpie. So, you know, I, I always appreciate the, the love and the support. Yeah, buddy, you got it. <laughs> um, Sharpie, I also creep a lot, both on social media. <laughs> and I did some serious creeping into Blackhawks TV, like early, mid-2000s. Oh, no. You were a gem on, uh, like, the cam, just walking around with, you know, point of view. I love when you call Tay's toe S and it seemed like <laughs> toes, you got really, you really got under his skin a lot. What were, what were some of the best pranks and maybe one of the best players that you pranked back in your hiatus? Yeah, it's always fun messing with Johnny for sure. Him and Kaner were, were so young and talented and then they were obviously the targets a lot and, and Kaner <laughs> would, would never give us much in terms of a reaction, but Tays, Tays would just like fly off the handle at the littlest thing. <laughs> Those videos are, are fun to, to go back and watch because it was a fun time for our team. We were all kind of the same age and era of our career, and and uh, we're all developing, having fun, just enjoying being in the NHL. And, you know, that was like the before the days of everybody filming everything on their phone. It was actual, like, one of those flip cams that, that Adam had given me from Blackhawks TV and said, just get whatever you can get. So it's a long flight over to Finland, I think we were going, and... You know, just a bunch of dumb young kids having fun, and I'm glad we got that footage. Ho- hopefully, some of it gets lost and, and disappears, but other stuff uh, brings back some good memories. Now, I, I think Patrick Kane certainly got to the point where he he got pretty good at at pranking you back, uh, from from what I understand. But your mom became a pretty big Patrick Kane fan through uh, through your tenure with the Blackhawks, right? I mean, she had a Patrick Kane jersey and. <laughs> you know, I mean, did did uh, did you ever talk to her about that? I mean, like, Ma, I mean, come on, you got you got a Patrick Kane jersey? Yeah, that was <laughs> um, that was one of our playoff years, uh, first playoff game, I think, of, of the run. And my parents were in town, and everybody was wearing jerseys back then. That wasn't always the case with uh, with the Hawks, but I think 2009 or 10, all of a sudden, all the fans just had red jerseys up in the crowd. So. My mom wanted to wear a jersey. We didn't have any sharp jerseys in the house, but I did have a caner lying around, so she threw it <laughs> on and went to the game. But, um, you know, that was that's a cool memory also. Uh, saw Brent Seabrook a couple days ago in, in Vancouver and, and uh, caught up with him. Of course, his mom just passed, but those memories of the mother's trip and the father's trip and all those playoff games and Christmases and holidays where all the guys' family would come in, we really were – a tight knit group and, and a family. So for my mom to wear the cane Jersey was like no big deal. She, uh, she loved all the players on the team and, and she felt like she was a part of it also. Well, Sharpie, all kidding aside, uh, you know, getting back to your home province, which okay, <laughs> it, it's on, it's Ontario, but you still have family in Alberta. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about where you grew up, uh, what, what, sh- what your parents did. And then, and then how come you ultimately moved, uh, 
not quite across the country, but, you know, certainly from from the foothills of the Canadian Rockies to, to lovely Ontario on the yeah. shores of Lake Superior. Yeah, we, we moved around a little bit. I was born in Winnipeg, um, where Taser was born. Duncan Keith was born there as well. So a bunch of guys came out of Winnipeg. But at the age of two, I think our family moved to Calgary for the 80s and, um, and spent the 1980s here in Calgary, where we are right now. And um, it was awesome place to grow up and, and learn how to play the game. Older brother Chris was a hockey player, so I just followed in his footsteps. The Flames won the Cup in 1989 when I was, uh, I don't know, must have been eight years old. So that was probably a huge influence on, on why and how I fell in love with the game. But in 1990, we moved to Thunder Bay, Ontario, and uh, stayed there for the rest of, of my life, really. that was That's where I kind of developed everything and, and grew up as a kid. And that's where all my friends are back in MT Bay and proud to represent that area as well. A ton of players in a small town came out of there and made it to the NHL. And I'm happy to be one of them. So, you know, I grew up with an older brother, Chris, who was very active in sports and I just followed in his footsteps. He always would set the bar and I try to surpass it somehow. So I give, give Chris uh, a lot of credit for, me being able to make it. And um, it's fun to be on these trips to, to go back to some of the cities that I grew up in. And of course, in Calgary, I'm going to get a chance to see Chris a little bit and, and hang out with him and his daughters. So it's, uh, you know, that's a fast forward version of, of how I grew up. You still look up to your brother a little bit? Yeah, for sure. He's, uh, he's a funny guy. And uh, he's changed a lot in his life as well over the years. He was like a 40 year old man when we were 10 years old he was like super responsible and always looking out for his little brother probably had to fight a little bit more than he wanted to as a kid because of his little brother but um yeah he's someone i i look up to and consider a best pal for sure ah well sharpie you kind of have the best of both worlds you get to still sort of feel like you're being a part of the team with the blackhawks traveling again but then you have your own family and fortunate you know when you retire from playing you get to spend all this time at home What's uh, what was the transition like for you being full time dad, managing two girls and just uh, kind of what was cool and what was kind of hard about getting to do that after you finished playing? Yeah, it depends who you ask if it was a good thing that I'm <laughs> home all the time or not. I mean, I think it's a good thing. I know um, Abby kicks me out every once in a while and, and enjoys when I'm on the road a few days a week. But, um, you know, it's, it's been cool being home. Miss so much in those those early years of my daughters being born, um, I forgot how much you're away when you're, you're doing the full 82 game schedule. But um, since I stopped playing home a lot more and, you know, my brother's got two daughters. I have two daughters as well. My girls, they haven't really like found the, uh, the competitive gene yet. They're like, they're like their mom. They're a little bit too nice, but uh <laughs> they ski, so that's the, the one sport that they do play, and, and Dad's always pushing them to play sports. So we've been doing a lot of skiing in um, in retirement, and that's something that the four of us can do as a family, and, and I think we all enjoy it. So, you know, it's it's awesome to to be home and to watch the, the girls grow up. They've changed so much over the years. They're already 9 and 11 years old, and I remember feels like yesterday that I was, like, doing interviews about, you know, having a newborn at home for both of them, so... Time flies, as you know, Kaylee, with uh, with a father that played a ton of years in the league. It's it's pretty cool to be able to spend time uh, with the loved ones, and you know, I'm looking forward yeah. to getting back from this trip for sure. I think my dad knew it was time to hang it up when his D partner in Atlanta was like a year or two older than me. He was <laughs> yeah. four, wow. 48, and he had wow. four kids that were older and around the same age as Zach Bogosian. Oh my so, god. Yeah. I think you picked a good time to go home. <laughs> For sure. Sharpie, when does your youngest daughter, Sadie, turn 10? Uh, she's October, so okay, October 13th. Both my daughters, like, I'll tell the story because it's awesome, but um, Madeline was born in December. Uh, and the very next day, we played San Jose. And I, we played the game. I was awful, but ended up scoring an overtime winning goal. We won the game 2-1. Hosa kind of made the whole play. I tapped one in. And I just thought it was unbelievable that the day after my daughter was born, I scored the overtime winning goal. Two years later, Sadie was born um, October 13th. And 
we played Carolina the next day and first period I scored on a breakaway and I was like, oh my God, I scored again after my daughter was born. Maybe that's going to hold up as the game winner. It didn't, but we went into <laughs> overtime and then a shootout. And Joel put me in the shootout third, scored the game-winning goal in the shootout. <laughs> so for both wow. daughters, two goals, uh, both game winners. I have the stick um, in each daughter's room when they were younger and tried to tell them the story because I thought it was cool, but they could care less about it. So I don't know what happened <laughs> to those sticks. They're somewhere in the house, I bet. You're just dad to them, which uh, yeah. is, is actually the coolest thing ever. Uh, that's a great story, though, Sharp. I appreciate you sharing that. I, and and the reason I asked about Sadie's birthday specifically is because she's uh, a, kind of a, a cup baby in some respects. She was born after the 2013 Stanley Cup championship. You're second of three. But speaking of anniversaries, I, I, it's the 10-year anniversary of that 2013 team, of course, that Started that season started uh, coming off a lockout. You guys went on the heater of all heaters to start the season and won the 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 president's trophy and then went all the way to win the Stanley Cup trophy as well. What do you remember about that season specifically? And um, you know any any uh, lots to choose from, but any signature moments come to mind? Yeah, a ton. I mean, that was the year we won the cup in 2010, and we had two years where we were. We're searching to replace half the team that we lost from that championship run. Um, the start of that 2013 season, there was no hockey. There was the, the lockout for the first half. So a lot of guys just stayed in Chicago and trained and worked out and, and tried to stay active. Uh, the other half of the guys were playing in different teams all across the world. And we got together in January. I was playing online with Kane and um, we're doing line drills and rushes. And I looked at him and was like, is it just me or is this team brutal like talking about our own team and I remember his response was yeah yeah who knows I mean we don't know but just worry about our own game and you know do what it gives like a standard answer and we started that season 24 games without a loss so it shows you how much I knew going into that year I didn't know anything about the group it was the year that Stan Bowman kind of replenished the team with a bunch of guys from Rockford that uh, was when Andrew Shaw showed up, Nick Letty, Brandon Sod, all these guys, this huge wave of Rockford players joined us and were really good all of a sudden. Brian Bickle was playing over in Europe and was skating as good as he's ever skated. He came and, and joined us and gave us a, a huge bump. And, and I think the guys that didn't play the first half just got better as the season went on. And it was um, right from the jump after that start, it was like Stanley Cup or bust and it was a pretty tough expectations to put on any team, despite what their record is in the regular season. But, you know, a couple signature moments got to be the Seabrook going over to Taves in the penalty box was pretty cool. And then Taser scoring shortly after that and just playing some of his best hockey in those big games. Um, Kaner in games five and six, scoring the biggest goals for us and, and being our MVP was just like textbook star player stepping up at the right time. Corey Crawford was uh, was our goalie and is often the player that I think from all those teams that gets left out the most. Like he was the reason why we were good all of a sudden again. There's a ton of great players on the team, but, but Crow was just a rock in the net. So he was awesome that year as well. But, um, you know, I, I got to start thinking about that now that it's the 10 year reunion and it start hopefully those memories start coming back a little bit more frequently. I remember hearing that, um, you know, everybody went to the locker room when Hosa was back in town um, for his jersey retirement. What are those moments like for you now? You know, just does it take you right back to where you were at that time and getting to go back to the locker room and, and have those moments again? Yeah, exactly. That's, it takes you right back to the moment. And I remember how I felt as a player. Like, a lot of things changed over the years. I don't think I'm the same person now as I was 10 or 15 years ago was when I was in the middle of it, but you get all those guys back together in the same room and they're smiling and telling stories. And the Hosa ceremony was awesome for Hosa, but I think more than anything, all the guys that came in for it, everybody was just so happy for that day. Everyone was smiling and laughing and, and having a great time. And I think it reminded me how much that group and, and all the other great teams that I was on, how much those guys uh, really meant to me and were a big part of my life. And, Seeing their faces, I think they felt the same way. So hopefully there's a bunch more of these uh, ceremonies and reunions and we can have some more good times.
Well, I'm not going to ask you to pick between your favorite kids, Sharpie, but I am going to ask you, of the three cups, is there one of them that felt a little sweeter than the others? I mean, or are they just so different? It's hard to, to put it into context. I mean, obviously, you guys went through a stretch that not many teams have done in the sport period. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm curious if, if, you know, maybe one felt a little sweeter than any of the others. They, it really doesn't, Colby. I mean, I'd like to think about it right now and tell you which one was my favorite. To me, it's all the same when I look back on it. It was one big chunk of time from like 2007 or 8 until 2015. The first one was special because it's just a roller coaster of emotions and you don't really know how to handle it the first time you go through it. And the way the city responded was like, was mind blowing really. So that one stands out. 2013, like not a lot of people can say they have two Stanley Cups. That was pretty special. And by then we were veteran partiers. So we, we were ready for the celebrations and, and all that comes with it. 2014, we lost in the conference finals, which I felt, everybody says this, oh, you could have, should have, would have. But I, I do feel like we get by LA in that game seven and um, we maybe go back to back for our third cup. So I think that 2015 cup, I don't think that was our, our best team, but because of what happened the previous year, it was like we knew we we let one get away from us. So to me, that was a special one because I saw a bunch of guys really dig deep, which was at the end of a long run, like the end of a good eight, nine year run. Everybody gave everything they could to, to get over the hump in that one. And we go back and look at 2015. There were so many close games. There was a lot of uh, late overtime games, uh, conference finals, finals. So they all tell a different story, but, you know, it's, it's really hard to, to put a finger on one favorite. Sharpie McKinnon gave a, an emotional answer after he won the cup last season when and Emily Kaplan asked him, I think, like, what he wanted to do with the cup or with his dad or something. And you could tell he had dreamt of the moment he was going to give the cup to his dad and gave, like, a really great response. When you won your first cup, you know, what was one of those dream moments or kind of surreal things that you'd always wanted to do with it or whether it was give it to your dad or, or share it with your family? Was there something that stood out to you the first time you won the cup? Yeah, I was thinking about it a lot. I didn't know really how it was going to play out. First, we had to win the game, but then I was thinking like, all right, is this thing heavy? I don't want to drop it. <laughs> Who do I pass it to? When do I go get it? Those are actually thoughts that went into my mind. And then um, when it was over, like, and I got the cup for the first time in 2010, all I was thinking about was like, oh, I can't wait to give this to my brother. I can't wait to bring this back to Thunder Bay and let all the guys, you know, party with this thing. I can't wait to see my mom you know, bring this into the, into the house and, and you know, maybe put some cereal in it or something like that. <laughs> I kept thinking about everybody else but me. So that's kind of the way I sum it up is like to be a, a pro hockey player, it's always about you and what time you got to practice and eat and sleep and train and when's the game and everything revolves around you. And then when, when you win that trophy, it's like you want to share it with everybody else. So that's kind of, kind of how I felt. And as the years went on, it was, it was hilarious to watch like, I was one of the lucky guys that won it a couple times and, you know, maybe sit there with Duncan and Sieves and say, oh, look at, look at Sheldon Brookbank in 2013 when he gets to hoist it for the first time. Johnny Oduya was partying so hard and he <laughs> won it for the first time. It was like just out of character behavior. And that's what's awesome is to see how everybody else kind of reacts. And uh, it's a special trophy, as you know, Kim. Well, Sharpie, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, we don't want to hold you up anymore. Uh, but thanks a lot for doing this. And I guess I did have, I did have just one, uh, one final question for you, you know, thinking about back to, uh, here we go. Yeah, so I'm thinking. Ago, here we go. You said something though. See, this is the thing, Sharpie, everything you say is on, on a broadcast is on the record. And I have sources that remind me of things that you said on the broadcast that I can use against you. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. You did say something about wishing, uh, you know, wondering. Once upon a time, if if you could be, if you were given the opportunity to be a Bears running back, <laughs> uh, you know what what you would what you would do if you could if you could run the ball in from from the one yard line, would you be able to uh, score a touchdown? So just a, kind of a kind of a funny way to uh, wrap things up. You know, take us through your fantasy football team this season. Um, 
But uh, you know, keep it keep it to uh, keep it to NHL players. Who would who are some NHL players that you would draft for uh, for a fantasy football team? You know, running back, quarterback, tight end, okay. kicker. Okay. You can pick Chris for the kicker if you want. It, it, it's fine. I, 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 I just want to be on the team, man. I'll I'll take I'll take punter even. Kicker's kind of like a finesse position, isn't it? Oh, okay. You know, so, so not maybe, Chris. Uh, maybe Kaner. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe Kaner would be the kicker because it's a clutch position. Clutch you gotta position. Come through right at the right moments, and uh, you got to have that delicate touch. So maybe Kaner would be the kicker. Uh, I put myself behind center because I got the best arm. <laughs> I'd be the quarterback. Okay. Uh, I'd have Seabrook snapping the ball to me as the center, right? But he'd play <laughs> both sides of the ball because he'd be a linebacker as well and just destroy people. Two-way player, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Hosa, I think, would be uh, probably a tight end, right? Yeah. He's big, like a wide receiver, but he's so big and strong that you put him at the tight end position. Great comp. Um, Dunks would be the running back because he's got the strongest legs and uh, can probably dance out there pretty good. I mean, that's a pretty good lineup right there. Who that's a great lineup. Taser, right? What would Taves be? He would be, uh, he'd be the coach of it all. He'd have a headset <laughs> on. He'd have the big paper out and... He'd be calling all the plays, so that's it's a good team. Well, Sharpie get in there too. How about Sharpie, Josh, where, gotta be like, where would you put Chris? Like, if you were going to put Chris on it, would he be like the uh, analytics guy up in the skybox, or like where, where would he be? Point First, definitely. I got to get to Yarmulson. Yarmulson yeah. would be on the defensive side. He'd be like a free safety that just kind of keeps everything in front of him. But but Bosters would have a special position. He would uh, he'd have the towels and the water. And whenever we needed something, we'd come over and, and get wiped out. I'd be messing with your drink, Sharpie. You wouldn't want to drink any, any water bottle. <laughs> I, I, I can't leave the nail on the head. I, I, I'd be the play-by-play guy. You'd be obviously. play-by-play. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Come on. It's like Benny and the Jet in the Sandlot, you know. For the Jet, everybody needs a Benny, so it's all right, Chris. <laughs> Happy, it, 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 it's uh, it's an honor. It, it it really is. I'd I'd love to be the announcer for your for your dream for your dream team. That uh, that'd be great. But you know, you you did a great job rostering your team. I mean, I I think uh, all those guys slot in really well. All right. Well, with that, we'll we'll say so long to Sharpie for now. Uh, again, tune in to our broadcast, NBC Sports Chicago, for uh, Patrick Sharp's outstanding color commentary. And I, and I'm not being I'm not being facetious when I say that Sharpie's doing an awesome job in the booth. I'm learning a ton, and I'm picking up uh, I'm picking up a lot on uh, on hockey commentary and hockey terminology from from Sharpie as well. So. It's uh, been a pleasure working with your partner, and uh, thanks for, for bringing all of your expertise and, and perspective to the booth. We, uh, we're we all having a lot of fun working with you. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me on, guys, and it's been fun this year being a part of the team. And I know we're all kind of getting started in new roles and I'm looking forward to seeing how we all grow and, and get better together. So it's it's been fun and happy to be teammates with you guys. All right. Kaylee, Colby, time for Sellies and Chirps, where each of us bring a topic to the group and invite the others to celebrate it or chirp it. You know the drill by now. I'll start. This is, uh, you know, as I, as I go through my first full season in, in the National Hockey League and I see more game situations play out and uh, in some cases see situations play out repeatedly, I have a, I have a pet peeve. And I don't think this is a, a, a rule that needs to be changed by any means, but it annoys me when you get a power play, when your team gets a power play or goes on the power play with less than two minutes to go in a period. Because, for example, if, if there are 45 seconds left in the first period and the Hawks go on a power play, well, then it, it really doesn't feel like a two-minute power play. It feels like a 45-second power play and then a one minute and 15 second power play at the start of the second period. And it, it interrupts the flow. I don't think a power play is as effective when it, when the two minutes gets hacked up like that. So what do you guys think is, is the, you know, especially with, with your insight on the game, um, you know, Colby, I guess as, as someone who, who, you know, played in, in a lot of power play situations, what, what do you think? Am I just making a mountain out of a molehill here? Well, you know what? It's it's interesting, Chris. So first off, I, I'm going to chirp you 
but but not a full <laughs> chirp, okay? Because I, 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 it's a semi chirp, and my reasoning for this is that as a player, I loved when this happened because you get to start with fresh ice, and having a power play with fresh ice is like the most exciting thing for a hockey player. I don't care if you're. Mm. 12 years old or I don't care if you're 35 and you're a hall of fame like you love that fresh ice power play that's what you're talking about between periods hey guys fresh ice let's zip it around you know you get a power play at the end of a period the ice is cut up it's a little snowy you know the things are just not happening as crisp or as clean and it's funny I I I used to work with um this guy named Chris Terrian in Philadelphia and you know he looked up the stats on this one time and I don't remember the exact number, but the number was way lower than I would have thought as far as a success rate once you started the second or third period with a partial power play, albeit a minute, 45, whatever it may be. And teams were not coming out and take advantage of the fresh ice, and they were not you know, um, you know, zipping it around and dialed in like they might have been to finish the last period. So I, I would be curious to hear your perspective on it just because you know we kind of come at things a little bit differently even though our backgrounds are are semi-similar yeah i don't think uh when i was in high school the intermission zamboni ride did too much for our top power play unit considering we had one line and usually one or two defensemen that got it done but uh yes i i'm with you though i'm gonna celebrate chris i do think that momentum in games sometimes and you look at a tv timeout too it's always a great way for a team that's kind of on their heels to regroup get set and it can change the momentum in a game pretty quickly and there was actually a funny tweet raised charlie romiliotis the nbc sports chicago blackhawks insider had somebody posed to him uh, a fan question that said if a player takes a penalty in the final like minute of the game you know should they should the opponent opposing team have the right to play out the full two minute power play even as time expires and it was a hard no from charlie and it would be a hard no for me too but it is true it's it's tough when you break up a power play or you know at the end of a game you're you know right you have another team on their heels like that and you wish you could like utilize that time but also, it's like, why not take a penalty there? 30 seconds, just keep icing it. It's more incentivizing for the other team. So good question. I like the Selian chirp, and I'll celebrate that I do think in, in certain instances it does kill the momentum for teams or it gives a PK unit time to, like, reset and get focused again. Kaylee, would you like yeah. to go next? I would love to. Oh, here we go. here we go. <laughs> I, I, Bring she's in the been, heat. She she's been she's been just striking nerves lately with these, so I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm ready over here. <laughs> Joey Bosa recently just got fined over fifty five thousand dollars for his comments on the officiating of the game in the playoffs. So my question, and recently what we've seen John Tortorella, Bruce Cassidy, Sheldon Keefe get fined $25,000 in the NHL. We've seen players get fined for comments on, on the officiating. So my question is, do you celebrate or do you chirp uh, players not being allowed to comment on the officiating of a game? Colby, why don't you uh, tell us, tell me what your thoughts are. I'm jonesing for it. Oh, I have so much to say, <laughs> Kaylee. I have so much to say. I... <laughs> This is this is something that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because and look, I'll start with this. Refereeing is a very thankless job. It's a hard job. I have friends that are officials. Just recently, I was between the benches and a former American League teammate of mine was doing the game on the line. So uh, I do not doubt how hard it is for these guys to do their job at full speed. I've been saying they need help in the skybox. They should have an earpiece. Like we need to give these guys help, but. They should be fair game like everybody else. I do not agree with this whole you cannot comment or criticize the refs. I think that when it comes to media, when it comes to questioning, players are put their their feet are put to the fire, coaches' feet are put to the fire, GM's feet are put to the fire. Why should the officials not have the same level of accountability within the media that everybody else is held to that standard? I don't even know if I'm celebrating or chirping it because now I'm all worked (laughs) up, but I ultimately can tell you, Kaylee, I I think that everyone should be fair game. And I think there should be accountability to be shared by everyone. 
Chris is smirking at me, so I'm sure he not only has something interesting to say, but I'm sure there's a dig coming my way. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to dig you, Colby. I mean, but I think that this is something that gets played out in multiple sports at least once a season, and this is just the latest chapter. And and I think that it violates professional decorum to air dirty laundry like that in the media. I think referees and officials are held accountable, but not in a public setting like that. They're held accountable at general manager meetings during the off season when rule changes are made. And that's when things actually get done. Nothing is going to come from Joey Bosa ripping on the officials. No rule changes are going to happen because of that. Well, that was a, that was, I mean, Kaylee does it again. <laughs> Kaylee brings that was awesome. hot topic to the, that was great though. Those Kelly were two Parker. phenomenal perspectives. I, I loved Colby's and then I was not expecting Chris's side of it. And really, really good point. I'm, I don't even know what I think about it anymore. I can't even give my cellular <laughs> trip on it. <laughs> my mind Ka- is in Kaylee, a... <laughs> Kaylee likes to walk into the conversation Light it on, light it up, and <laughs> yeah. then she just walks Walk out. Away. Yeah, and then she I, I didn't expect this. <laughs> you, you um, knew what you were doing, CC. Don't even. Start. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to add any more because that was really good. So, I'll, Colby, why don't you take it away for us with your final Sally and Chirp? All right. Well, mine's a little more Chicago based, and it's a story that I, I had read online or actually listened to online about calling dibs with parking spots in um, the face of a snowstorm. And, you know, the the topic is about street parking. You've got all these row homes, you know, throughout Chicago. And, you know, people dig their car out of a street spot. And then what do they do? They put a lawn chair in the street spot. They put their ironing board in the street spot. And, you know, it's funny because this is not the only city that it happens. Because this did used to happen back when I lived in Charlestown in Boston. It was the first time I ever saw it and was like shaking my head could not believe that people were doing this and what i found out was if you take someone's lawn chair and you move it there's a good chance if you park in that spot your tires are going to get slashed or you're going to have a big old key mark next to your car so my thought and my question to you two are, are we celebrating you get to keep your spot or are we chirping it and like it's fair game if you move your car whether you dug it out or not it's a street spot this is a city we all pay taxes kaylee what are you thinking i have to chirp it i feel like when you leave you're out you're gone it's not your spot i myself have some secret parking tricks up my sleeve in the city of chicago i can share off off camera but i i think if you're gone (laughs) (laughs) you're gone so Fair game. I do not think you can stick lawn chairs, although I have definitely been guilty of putting cones in certain things in spots that I wanted in the long haul. So I'm on I'm on the bad people side. I do stuff like that, but I definitely don't celebrate it. I should be chirped for it. <laughs> so do do as I say, not as I do. Not All as right, I Chris. do. Right. <laughs> All right. Hey, yeah, in honestly, Chicago, I like is, it. In Chicago, this is a tale as old as time or at least as far back as automobiles have been around, I guess, or maybe maybe they had dibs in the in the horse drawn carriage age as well. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but I I go back and forth on this. I really do, especially as a Chicago resident who has had to street park since I've lived in the city. And you know, again, I I think at the end of the day, I understand where you know people are coming from, especially when you get a monster blizzard like Chicago will sometimes get. And I mean, I've had to dig my car out from, you know, snow up to, and in some cases over the rear view mirrors after, after the plows come through. So it, it can be a lot of work, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I just don't think, look, it, it's, it's public, it's public domain. Um, you know, you can't, you can't just tie up, a a street spot if you want your own parking spot that bad then move to the suburbs um so i guess i'm i'm still gonna chirp it but at the same time i would never ever dare to park to like move somebody i mean sometimes it's like a bucket like i would never dare to move somebody's piece of trash essentially and park in their spot because i would be fearful of retribution so 
I guess again, you know, my my actions speak louder than words. I'll I'll chirp it, but I'm still not going to take somebody's spot when I see it dibs. Well, listen, this has been a, another fun episode, and great to be at this point in the season with you. Happy All Star Break, everybody, and we will reconvene when the regular season games resume. Uh, another exciting month of February ahead with some. Big road trips coming up in Eastern Canada, road swing. The Hawks were in Western Canada right before the All-Star break. And then, uh, of course, with the trade deadline coming in, I mean, that's the elephant in the room right now as far as the Blackhawks and their fans are concerned. So much to discuss in the remaining months of the season. And thanks for making the Blackhawks Insider Podcast a part of your Blackhawks content. And look, in my opinion, you can never get enough Blackhawks content. So if you're looking for more too, head over to Blackhawks.com for the latest and the greatest content related to the Chicago Blackhawks. Thanks to Brad Dollar and Southside Jake for the music. Thanks to Trevor Bray and Jenna Rose for their producing work behind the scenes. With that, for Colby and Kaylee, I'm Chris saying so long. Enjoy the rest of your all-star break. And we'll talk to you next time on the Blackhawks Insider Podcast.